the nature of languages is absolutely unique, in which we can make sure just by looking at their stages of development, their ability to be born and die, and most importantly, their magical ability of being called from the dead, of being revived. Such a thing has even a scientific term of language revitalization or language revival. Today, I'm inviting you to have a look at some examples of such a thing, to be more precise at five of them. Of course, there are more, but we'll talk about them in the second part of this video. So now, before we continue, make sure to be subscribed to the channel so you don't miss it. Although many linguists try to uh, calculate the exact number of languages spoken and written on our planet, in which, by the way, some of them succeed, the World Atlas of Languages, for example, claims there are 8,324 languages spoken or signed, documented by the governments, public institutions and academic communities. Out of that number, around 7,000 languages are still in use. This number should be looked at as a rough one, since the use of some languages is fairly unstable, which sometimes, unfortunately, leads to a language loss. In many parts of our world, languages spoken by minority and indigenous peoples are rapidly disappearing and becoming extinct. But what are the exact causes of a language to lose its speakers? Well, they might vary. But as it often happened in history, for example, a certain language was replaced by another one due to colonization, politics, unfortunately or not, play a huge role here. Before we go closer to the examples, there is another thing we should also keep in mind. Such terms as language revitalization and language revival are sometimes claimed to be different. Language revival is said to mean the resurrection of an extinct language, native speakers of which don't exist anymore. Meanwhile, language revitalization is supposed to mean the rescue of a dying language that lost all of its first language speakers, but still has those who speak it as a second language. However, today I'm not calling you to go deep into linguistic terms and definitions. Instead, let's just have a general look at those languages that were on the brink of dying out, disappearing, losing their speakers, or even going through a literal death, but then were revived and are now in use again. As Joshua Fishman in his book Reverse in Language Shift says, language revitalization may sound romantic to some readers. However, it should be stressed at the outset that it is a formidable and daunting task. Certain scholars consider a language dead when it is no longer used as the vehicle of communication in the community. In this view, revival of the language means restoring it to the state where it is again used as the means of communication. It is an extremely difficult task to achieve, despite the existence of the celebrated success story of Hebrew, with which we are going to begin. Hebrew belongs to the branch of Semitic languages and, more precisely, to the Canaanite group of languages. The Hebrew language is claimed by historians to date back to the 10th century BCE. In those ancient times, the Jews spoke the language that may now be presented by different names – Hebrew, ancient or early Hebrew, Biblical Hebrew. This is the language in which the Biblical texts were composed, and for this reason Hebrew has been called the Holy Tongue, or the Tongue of Holiness by Jews since ancient times. Later, the language developed into the so-called Mishnaic Hebrew, which apparently happened under the pressure of another dialect. The name of it came from the Mishnah, 
the first major written collection of the Jewish oral traditions known as the Oral Torah, composed in exactly this Mishnic Hebrew. Following the historical records, we know that later the era of the so-called Babylonian captivity occurred, when Jewish people were taken captive by king of Babylon and faced exile from the kingdom of Judah. Being forced to leave, they lived in Babylon between this period of time. The Hebrew language started to lose its status of being a regular spoken language, as its speakers were getting used to speaking the language of the area they now found themselves, Aramaic. The Aramaic language would continue to be used by Jews up until the Middle Ages, a somewhat decisive factor to the language loss, roughly speaking, came to be this revolt, carried out unsuccessfully against the Roman Empire by the Jews of Judea. The revolt was the third and final war between the Jewish people and the Roman Empire, with the end of which Jewish population was mostly killed, enslaved or exiled, and their hopes as a nation were completely shattered. Around the 3rd century, Hebrew fell out of colloquial use completely. In the Jewish diasporas, Hebrew was switched to the languages of the surrounding population, and later their own spoken versions of these languages were formed. The most famous of them is probably Yiddish, which originated in around 9th century in Europe. Although we have to remember that Yiddish and Hebrew are totally different languages, in a sense that they belong to distinct language families. But the interesting thing about Hebrew is that it had been always in use, not in a use that we first think of it as a mother tongue, until the 19th century, as linguists say, nobody spoke Hebrew. Let's come back for a minute to the book of Joshua Fishman and let's see what he has to say on this topic. While it is true that the most adept could read and write Hebrew freely within the bounds of traditional subject matter, and that in the 19th century a few generations of the more modernized among them could use the language in a variety of modern literary genres, secular poetry, essays, journalistic reporting, short stories and novels, it is also true that even they could not and did not converse in that language about the normal rounds and concerns of everyday life. Of course, there were rare occasions when strained conversation utilizing spoken Hebrew as a lingua franca did occur when two Jews met who shared neither a Jewish nor a non-Jewish vernacular. But such occasions were both exceedingly rare and exceedingly trying. Hebrew came into the medieval period as the Judaic language of prayer, the language of the so-called rabbinic literature, and remained so until the 19th century, when the language entered the path of rebirth, so to speak. The revival of Hebrew took place in two different parallels. There was a revival of a written literary Hebrew and a spoken one. The first one occurred thanks to the so-called Jewish Enlightenment, which has a name of Haskalah. The main aim was to protect and maybe even renew Jewish nation as a unique cultural layer, including the language, of course. Members of this group decided to form the beginning of modern Hebrew literature, in which they succeeded. However, the language they were creating the literary works in for modern Hebrew literature was far away from modern itself. All those literary works were first created in the Biblical Hebrew, which obviously made it difficult or even impossible to write on certain contemporary topics instead of 
only biblical ones. The Hebrew vocabulary of that time really lacked the new modern words since the language hadn't been in everyday use for centuries, which made it impossible to translate or write books on topics related to the period of time they were living in. There is, however, one writer of the Haskalah-era literature that is considered to be the man who had coined many new words, adding them to the Hebrew vocabulary, or else borrowed them from other languages, which, of course, helped the process of lexical modernization of Hebrew a lot. And now, what about spoken Hebrew? There was this person who did really a lot to revive Hebrew as a spoken language and is actually regarded by many as the reviver of Hebrew. He invented many new words that he added to the Ben Yehuda Dictionary, the first volume of which he published in 1908. Yet there's something that gained some notoriety for Ben Yehuda, and more precisely his point of view on the Hebrew revival itself claiming that Hebrew had been dead all those years before, mainly thanks to his own efforts, it was finally revived. Ben Yehuda received a lot of reuse of other authors and scientists who didn't share the same opinion and argued Hebrew had not actually been a dead language, since, as some claim, it is impossible to revive a language that was completely dead. Nevertheless, Eliezer ben Yehuda is remembered as a man thanks to whom standard Hebrew was developed, that is the official language of the State of Israel and spoken by around 9 million people worldwide, showing the most successful and some even say the only successful story of a language revival. The next stories of the languages that were attempted to be revived are not going to look as successful as the previous one, with a huge number of speakers, let alone natives. But anyways, they are going to look breathtaking. Let's have a look now at the fascinating story of the language of St. Patrick and Shamrocks, the Irish language. Irish, also known as Gaelic, belongs to the Celtic language family. Irish was the first language of the population of Ireland. It is a well-known fact that a language depends highly on politics as well, and in this sense Irish had suffered sufficiently. Viking, Norman, English invasions, despite that the Irish language was able to regain its status of the main one on its land by 1500. It served as a language of literature and culture in both Ireland and Scotland. However, starting from the 16th century, it ceased to be the dominant language of the Irish people, being gradually suppressed by English as a spoken language. As an American writer Charles Monaghan in his article The Revival of the Gaelic Language says, slowly but surely, the dominant influence of the English language over Ireland resulted in the discontinuance of Irish as a spoken tongue. English became the language of everyday life, was taught to Irish children in the so-called national schools, was the medium of printed matter and finally, the Irish language became a curiosity in many parts of Ireland. The more English began to enter the country, the more it was used at the state level and in church, the faster Irish was going out of everyday use. Soon it could be heard only, for the most part, in the western and southern areas of the country, where the speakers were predominantly the rural poor. It was them who were particularly vulnerable to such changes. Very soon, most, and perhaps even all, of that poor population would die out due to the famine and epidemic, while some of the others 
would leave the country emigrating to other places. As a result, the 19th century saw a frightening number of Irish speakers, which had declined to roughly half a million. 1831 saw the establishment of national schools, where one of the main tasks was the popularization of the English language, which was totally supported by the Catholic Church and political leaders, Daniel O'Connell in particular. Some sources even suggest that those children who attempted to speak Irish during the class were beaten by teachers in order to discourage children to speak the language completely and go for English instead. However, despite all the prohibitive laws and other similar policies towards the Irish language, in the latter half of the 19th century there were a number of scholars who became interested in the idea of reviving the language and the Irish culture itself. It all started with a mere interest in preservation of the language and its literature. Irish Gaelic culture in general, including music, sports, mythology, folklore, etc. In November 1892, an Irish scholar, Douglas Hyde, delivered a lecture called The Necessity for de-anglicizing Ireland before the Irish National Literary Society in Dublin, in which he argued that all parts of life had become anglicized to an alarming extent and only reviving the language will let the Irish race once more become what it was of yore, one of the most original, artistic, literary and charming peoples Europe. Already the following year, in 1893, when Gaelic was on the verge of extinction, Douglas Hyde became a president of Gaelic League, which took the restoration of the Irish language upon itself as its main goal. What the organization began with was teaching the language in those areas where spoken Gaelic was still alive and make people be able to read and write in their own language. Soon the first newspaper of the Gaelic League, Sword of Light, appeared. The post office accepted the idea that parcels and letters could be addressed in Irish. St. Patrick's Day played a key role in reviving the Irish spirit. The leaders and enthusiasts of the Gaelic League looked at St. Patrick's Day as an ideal opportunity to celebrate Irish identity and to revive interest in the Irish language and in Irish culture. They began organizing this day with parades and tried to catch as much attention as possible till they finally succeeded. In 1903, St. Patrick's Day became a national holiday by the Bank Holiday Act. However, the fate of the organization was not always without problems and did not always go calmly. The League, from its very beginning, took up non-political principles and, as Douglas Hyde mentioned, was neither a unionist nor a separatist. Yet, the Irish Republican Brotherhood the Irish Republican Army in the future saw the Gaelic language as a tool to separate Ireland and Britain. One of the League's members, Patrick Pearce, became Hyde's opponent in this issue. He once said that the Gaelic League brought to Ireland not peace, but a sword. The IRB later began push the League into accepting the nationalistic and separatist movement, about which its president was certainly unhappy and against. It was the growing politicization of the movement that made Hyde resign the presidency in 1915. The following year, 
the Easter Rebellion, an armed uprising against British rule in Ireland, took place, which Hyde strongly opposed and was shocked that members of his league could take part in something like that. As for Douglas Hyde, in 1938 he would become the first president of Ireland, chosen by the Irish who liked and admired him. And as for the Irish language, it continued, and still does, to survive against the odds. Nowadays, it is the national language of the Republic of Ireland, along with English. Yet, Irish is used by a small percentage of population. As we can see, the UNESCO's Atlas of World Languages classifies Irish as definitely endangered which means that children no longer learn this language as a mother tongue. Some linguists foresee a good future for the language, though, and the fact itself that such a language as Gaelic, which was so close to extinction, was finally saved, is fairly astonishing. And now, from the British Isles, let's go to visit Oceania. Let's look closer at this impressive part. New Zealand and see what language they speak on this island. Maori are the indigenous people of New Zealand who have their own language, the so-called Te Reo Maori. They are said to have Polynesian roots. All their mythology, arts, language evolved from some other Polynesian cultures. Nowadays, the official language of the country is English, along with its indigenous one, which nevertheless is not considered to be safe yet. The native language of Maori had been losing its power and disappearing from everyday life for a long time before the revival of the language and Maori heritage in general took place. What was the cause of its decay? And how were Maori able to breathe a new life into the indigenous language? Let's find it out. The starting point of this story is the year of 1840, when New Zealand became a colony of Britain, which in turn brought many waves of new population to this part of the world. The major event happened when the two sides signed the treaty, the document that meant the British colonization over New Zealand and their foundation of a new nation, so to speak. But what was wrong about it? The thing is that the treaty, written in two languages, English and Maori, had various inaccuracies and mistakes in translation, the mistakes that simply cannot take place in documents concerning sovereignty. All this was, of course, followed by land disputes and all kinds of disagreements that later turned into the New Zealand Wars. I'm sure you can imagine what effect it made on the indigenous language and its people. A harsh decrease in Te Reo Maori speakers. Consequently, the English language became the language of communication and trade which made Te Reo Māori almost completely fall out of use. And one of the reasons for that was the Native Schools Act of 1867 that prohibited speaking Māori at schools, and those children who didn't obey were punished. This way, Māori quickly became a minority language. The natives usually lived in isolated areas, meanwhile the rest of the country was quickly filling up with non-Māori population that also provoked the dominance of the English language. By the 1950s, certain Māori leaders had realized the risk of a total loss of the Māori language. So, in the following several years, there were some strategies planned and used to save the language. Some Māori language revitalization programs, for example, helped infants to immerse in Māori from infancy to school age. 
the fruits of language revitalization efforts clearly appeared in 1987, the year of the so-called the Maori Language Act, passed by the Parliament of New Zealand that gave official language status to the Maori language. Finally, there showed up a real appreciation for Maori culture, its language and its heritage. A big interest grew towards Maori and the importance of its protection. As we can see now, both the government and the country's population are interested in willing to protect their indigenous heritage. In 2019, New Zealand government launched the language revitalization strategy with the goal of 1 million people speaking Te Reo Māori by 2040. That might seem hard to reach for some, but the language's clear success makes us believe in a bright future for the Māori language. The next language, the amazing story of which we're going to discover now, can't probably be named exactly revived. However, considering what state this language was in a couple of centuries ago, a little period of time of a language life, it is surprising it's not extinct now and is successfully making its way to become a language spoken in its historical land again. The language of Cornwall, a county of southwest England, Cornish. Cornish belongs to the Celtic language family, along with Welsh and Breton, very often called its sister language. It originated from the common Bretonic language, which was spoken across large territory of Great Britain before the English language became the main one. The history of the Cornish language is usually divided into several periods, but it is the Middle Cornish period, lasting from 1200 till 1600, that can be viewed now as the most wonderful time for the language. Cornish literature was literally flourishing, particularly with its mystery plays. That's the period we shall begin with. From the beginning of the 17th up until the 19th century, the language had been in its decline. Here is some interesting part of what a British translator and antiquary wrote in his survey of Cornwall, published in 1602. During those times, England and Cornwall were still regarded as different countries. Nevertheless, the Cornish language had already begun to fall out of use. In this Journal of Celtic Studies we can read the following. During just over two centuries, Cornish went from being the primary language spoken by half the country to a curiosity for linguists and later a subject for antiquarians. The language of Cornwall had been a backward language and was a language associated with Catholics. Cornish gentry completely abandoned it and ordinary people followed their example. Cornish, therefore, became the tongue of the poor and of the fishermen of the western part of the peninsula, while English acquired the status of the dominant language of the rest of the population. During the 19th century there was, unfortunately, no particular intention to revive Cornish, and only in the following century did someone finally decide to change the history of the Cornish language for the better. It was Henry Jenner, a British scholar of the Celtic languages, and his A Handbook of the Cornish Language, published in 1904, that are now considered to be the start point for the revival of the Cornish language. As it usually happens, and as we have already seen it today on the previous examples of language revivals, the first things that need to be done in order to revive a language is to standardize and reconstruct the language, pouring in new vocabulary for new things and concepts, and after all, creating teaching materials. 
In this, the already mentioned today middle Cornish literature was handy. British writer Robert Morton Nance published his work Cornish for All in 1929 and a dictionary of unified Cornish in 1938, which was developed as a variant spelling based on traditional Cornish manuscripts. During the same centuries, there were many disputes going on among different groups of Cornish revival activists, for example, on its spelling rules, until there was finally an end put to all these disputes. A single and official spelling system was finally created, which was followed by the recognition of Cornish as a British minority language, taking place in 2002. Nowadays, the future of Cornish looks much better than, say, a century ago. Coming back again to the UNESCO's atlas, we can see that Cornish is classified as critically endangered. But taking into account that its true revival began just a bit more than a century ago, which is, again, very little in historical retrospect. The Cornish language seems to be on its right way. The number of Cornish speakers is said to be growing, even though at a very, very slow pace, supported by Cornish Council. The last story of language revival we're going to have a look at today is only beginning to take momentum. Let's travel now to the largest island of the United States and look at another very interesting Polynesian language, Hawaiian. The Hawaiian language, belonging, by the way, to the same language family group as Maori, was heard of for the first time ever in 1778, when British explorer James Cook came to the island. It was also at that time when the natives started to have interactions with foreigners. There's a well-known boy in this story who had a major impact on the future of the language. Having sailed to New England, he is said to have become a student in one of the schools in Cornwall, Connecticut. It was he who inspired and supported a Christian mission to Hawaii to be made by New Englanders and gave a bulk of information on the Hawaiian language to the American missionaries who departed there in 1819. After their arrival, just in some years, they began converting people into Christianity. This was obviously followed by the necessity of translating the Bible into Hawaiian, and remember that before, that language had never had a written form. So, first of all, they needed to create a spelling system that would be easy enough and quick to master. Luckily, the standard spelling system, the orthography made by the missionaries, was so simple and clear that literacy spread fairly fast. More and more schools were beginning to be built. The missionaries actually did a lot for the Hawaiian language. Newspapers in the Hawaiian language started to be published. They contributed a lot to the publishing of grammar, vocabulary, dictionary. Now, what about the Bible that was actually the starting point of the creating the orthography of the language? Of course, the Hawaiian Bible was completed already in 1839. At that time, the level of literacy reached amazing results. In the 1850s, more than a half of the population could read. The Hawaiian authorities mandated compulsory, state-founded education for children. Moreover, and which is very interesting, the Hawaiians are claimed by some scholars to be the most literate nation of that time. This was the Hawaiian king who contributed a lot to the level of education of the kingdom. He was in favor of making education even more popular, creating governmental programs of sending students abroad to make their skills even better. However, soon after, there were other plans, plans on 
taken the Hawaiian kingdom over. The overthrow of the Hawaiian kingdom happened in 1893, during the reign of the king's sister, the last sovereign monarch of the Hawaiian kingdom. For obvious reasons, the Hawaiian language was of course hid by new laws, which was followed by the decline of the language. People anyways continued to speak their language, even though that continued only until speaking Hawaiian was clearly and openly prohibited, and sometimes even punished. A number of native, pure Hawaiian students was going drastically down year after year. The prestige of the indigenous language also decreased a lot. People now saw their prosperous future in speaking English. Plus, due to a big number of non-native population, English was now an everyday tool of communication with schoolmates, neighbors, which very soon made it a dominant language in Hawaii. And only in the 1970s the Hawaiian language and culture overall were destined to see the light again. The Hawaiian Renaissance began. In 1983 a language nest appeared, a preschool program inviting native Hawaiians to speak to their children in their indigenous language at home. A person who played a major role in the Hawaiian Renaissance was this Hawaiian scholar who was called a living treasure of Hawaii in 1977. She was the co-author of the Hawaiian English Dictionary, first published in 1957. Besides, she was a collector of oral stories, proverbs, sayings and songs that are part of many books she published that certainly are valuable resources on Hawaiian customs and traditions. In recent decades, despite all the problems and difficulties, efforts to promote and popularize Hawaiian have noticeably increased. There are Hawaiian language immersion schools, there have been some attempts to create Hawaiian programs running on TV and newspapers featuring articles written in Hawaiian. However, the number of native speakers of Hawaiian is, for now, far enough from being able to claim its safety. The language is still classified as critically endangered by UNESCO. Nowadays, as some scholars claim, Hawaiian pidgin, a Creole English-based language, is more commonly used in everyday communication rather than Hawaiian itself. After all, it is impossible not to notice all the attempts and, most importantly, success to some extent of popularization and possibly in the future the revival of the Hawaiian language. Will the language gain enough strength to continue growing the numbers of its speakers? Will it be another successful story of language revitalization? Time will tell. I think the best way to finish up this video is probably with this saying. When even one language falls silent, the world loses an irredeemable repository of human knowledge. We all, I presume, will agree that by preserving indigenous languages, we preserve indigenous cultures. If you found this video worth your time, Please don't forget to give it a like and also check out my website where you can subscribe to the Language Easy newsletter, which is absolutely for free. Now, thanks for watching and see you next time.